the story of the Bell Witch, there is an old John Bell, a young John Bell, and a Captain John Bell. But which John Bell is which? I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lunch. Tennessee is home to delicious whiskey, great music, and some of the most beautiful mountains you will ever see. But it's also home to a lot of ghost stories. From the Tsulkalu of Cherokee folklore to the Trianan of Appalachia, there is no shortage of terrifying legends associated with Tennessee and the surrounding area. One of those stories is the legend of the Bell Witch, which some people have connected to the presence of a possible Native American burial ground on the Bell family property. That would not be particularly difficult to believe or understand, as the area has seen a number of cultures and a number of tragedies occur. In the 16th century, Spaniards encountered people belonging to the Mississippian culture, but within just a couple of centuries, many of them were wiped out by new European diseases. Over the next couple of centuries, the area known today as Middle Tennessee would sort of be viewed as a hunting ground more so than a living space for many of the Native Americans and pioneers of the area. The most powerful of the tribes in the region were the Cherokee, who had territory stretching from Virginia into North Carolina and then westward into Tennessee. And the Cherokee are a bit of a mystery in and of themselves. They speak an Iroquoian language, yet they're considerably further south than any of their cousins. The Iroquois Confederacy, as you may know, inhabited mostly northern Pennsylvania and central upstate New York. Of course, there were other Iroquois Iroquoian-speaking peoples who inhabited the same general region, but the Cherokee were particularly far south. The leading theory regarding how they got there is that sometime in the distant past they migrated down from the Great Lakes region and ended up in the Appalachians, but there are a small group of scholars who wonder if it was the reverse and the Iroquoian languages had actually developed in the southern Appalachian region. If the former is correct, then they moved into the area previously occupied by the Mississippian mound-building cultures and in some senses blended with their remnants and also sort of took over their homeland. That culture was on its way out by the 1500s, so the Cherokee coming in makes sense. Their first documented interactions with Europeans were with the English, possibly as early as 1657, but certainly into the 1660s, and within just five decades, they would end up allying with the British against the Tuscarora. When the British fought the Amasi peoples a few years later, initially the Cherokee kind of played both sides, sided with the Amasi for a bit, but ended the war on the side of the English. And then they joined the English again in yet another war in 1755. They had become quite closely aligned with the English in the first half of the 18th century. They ceded part of what would become South Carolina to that colony in 1721 and signed a formal treaty with the English in 1730. British Army officer Henry Timberlake in 1761 described the Cherokee in the following manner. They were of middle stature, of an olive color, generally painted, and their skins stained with gunpowder, pricked into it in very pretty figures. So he's describing tattoos. They wore their hair shaved or plucked with a small circle left in the center rear of the scalp, and they would wear that long, usually with feathers or beads woven into it. He also wrote of a painful procedure in which the ears were split and a metal wire or rod run through them to make the ear larger. I didn't totally understand what he was describing, but it did not sound comfortable. But as the second half of the 18th century came along, the Cherokee's alliance with the English was becoming a little bit more feeble. The French had been making inroads, offering trade, military assistance, and generally the same things as the English, if only to get the Cherokee to not fight. And while the Cherokee were a powerful tribe and were often willing to go to war against other Native Americans with their English allies, the French were a different beast. This was a logistically and scientifically advanced empire, not a small tribe that had crossed over into their territory. And then, in 1758, a company of Virginia militiamen attacked a Cherokee chieftain, a man named Moitoy of Sitico, in Monroe County, Tennessee. Now, this attack was in response to an alleged horse theft, which, if you've watched any of our other videos that involve the interaction between Americans and Native Americans, you will find that alleged horse theft is a very common reason for violence from both sides. In this case, however, it might have been a legitimate misunderstanding. The Cherokee warband fighting under Moitoy was under the impression, had agreed with the English, that they would be getting horses resupplied to them along their way back from fighting the French. The Cherokee as a whole had not gone to war with the French, but a few tribes and bands had done so. 
What may have happened in this case is that they arrived at one of those forts and either they were at the wrong fort to get their horses or the fort hadn't received word that they were supposed to give horses. This resulted in them just taking the horses and then the Virginia militiamen going back to get them and a skirmish ensuing. This in turn led to a series of retaliatory conflicts known as the Anglo-Cherokee War until 1761. And due to the decentralized nature of the Cherokee Nation government where you had Chief, tribal chieftains who would interact with one another in councils, this was a very scattered and asymmetrical conflict. It wasn't a lot of line-style battles, it wasn't, you know, big armies, these were minor skirmishes. After the French and Indian War, however, the English managed to install a pro-England ruler over the entirety of the Cherokee, based on the treaty that they had created with them in 1730. That had seen the Cherokee recognize King George II as the protector of the Cherokee nation and people, in turn for naming one of the Cherokee chieftains as Emperor of the Cherokee. That first chieftain was Moitoy of Sitiko, and while this Emperor of the Cherokee or first beloved man of the king was not an official Cherokee ruler, he was the person the English would side with if there were internal conflicts within the Cherokee nation, which made him a very powerful man. So it made sense that that person should probably be in the pocket of the English crown. After the war, this title was transferred to a Cherokee chieftain named Atakula Kula. Additionally, the proclamation of 1763 was signed by King George III, and this was a bit of an issue. You see, what the proclamation did was establish the proclamation line, which was a border west of which colonists could not settle. The issue here, the crown had promised land west of that line to American colonists in exchange for their support during the French and Indian War. So during the war, the Crown had promised those colonists that they could settle lands west of the Appalachians and become rich beyond their wildest dreams and have a future for their families. And meanwhile, the Crown had also promised the Cherokee, hey, nobody's gonna settle in your lands, we'll keep you safe. And it did not take long at all for this proclamation line and land promised to the West issue to come to a head. In 1773, soon-to-be legendary Pennsylvania-born pioneer Daniel Boone made his way into the Kentucky Territory. It was not his first trip, but this was the first time that he was trying to establish a legitimate settlement. The Cherokee, as well as several other Native American tribes and nations, saw what was going on here with American colonists coming over the Appalachians to settle in that region as illegal. It was in violation of their treaty with the English crown. The colonists, on the other hand, had some justification. That land had been sold to them by the Iroquois. Now, the problem with that was the Iroquois were not the Cherokee, and the Cherokee were not the Iroquois, and they did not agree with each other on this. So when Daniel Boone, who was traveling with the party of William Russell, which is not the same William Russell as the one in our Donner Party video, when he came through Kentucky, their party was attacked by a band of Cherokee or Shawnee. They ended up capturing both William Russell and Daniel Boone's sons, torturing them, and then eventually killing them, which did not set things off well for the first settlers into Kentucky. And of all the people whose sons they could have ended up killing, these were probably two of the worst. Obviously, Daniel Boone would go on to become one of the most famous American frontiersmen, and William Russell would eventually become the brother-in-law of Patrick Henry. And this gave him quite a few contacts in the new United States government after the Revolutionary War. And Russell would also distinguish himself in the Revolutionary War, rising to the rank of Brigadier General and fighting at the Battle of Yorktown. Relations did eventually normalize between the Cherokee and the Americans, but only after the brutal Second Cherokee War, in which the American counterattack was so devastating that the Cherokee lost territory deep into Tennessee. After that, the peace agreement was signed at Teleco Blockhouse in 1794, and was followed by a series of other treaties. That first Teleco Blockhouse Treaty in 1794 recognized the previously established borders between the Cherokee and the United States. The first of the following treaties compensated the Cherokee in exchange for land that had been illegally settled, and then the next three were basically outright land purchases. And once these territories were purchased, many of the new settlers to the region were Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. As a result of this, a mixed population of Scottish Highlanders and Cherokee developed, and the two found that they had an odd amount in common in terms of both being screwed over by the English and also just lifestyles. The clan structure, the way that things worked between families and between governments, between the Scottish Highlanders and the Cherokee, were all rather familiar to one another. They weren't identical, they weren't perfectly matched, but it meant that these two groups were able to live in a relative harmony. This was helped by the fact that the Cherokee were considered one of the five civilized tribes 
by the Europeans and the Americans, which were a group that they recognized as bearing more of the traits that Europeans considered civilized than some of the, the others. So basically, these ones were, they recognized the way they did things more than the way everyone else did, is probably the most charitable way to put it. Still, the settler population was growing rapidly and they needed land to live on, so the government offered the Cherokee land out to the west in Arkansas. Their hope was that the Cherokee would voluntarily relocate, and some did, in fact a large number did, but a significant enough portion stayed behind. For Georgia specifically, this was not enough, though Tennessee and Kentucky also were looking to get some of that Cherokee territory, and Georgia decided that they were just going to keep pushing the measures, keep pushing the issue. And unfortunately, neither the Cherokee's status as one of those five civilized tribes, nor their admixture with the Scots would spare them. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, and this began the forced exodus of Native American peoples from the, what was then, American frontier. The Cherokee sued to keep their lands and won support from the National Republican Party, which was an anti-Jackson party, which was a precursor to the modern Republican Party. Ralph Waldo Emerson also lobbied aggressively on behalf of the Cherokee, as did Samuel Worcester. Worcester was known for translating the Bible into the Cherokee language and also helping to establish the first Cherokee language newspaper. The Cherokee were successful in court and in fact did win their case, but Jackson just ignored them and allowed Georgia to do what it wanted, pushing the Cherokee further and further out. With the judicial and the executive branches of the government in conflict, it fell to the legislative to try and find a solution, a middle ground, and they eventually did, organizing a sale of Cherokee land. So the U.S. government purchased the territory it wanted in exchange for $5 million in 1830 currency, as well as a large swath of land in Oklahoma. However, Cherokee chieftain John Ross then went to the Senate and petitioned them to not sign this, to not push this through, because it was not signed, it was not voted for by a majority of the Cherokee. It was just a small council of Cherokee chiefs, and he felt that that did not represent the wishes of the wider body. Essentially, he was saying those guys did not have the authority to make this deal, so you cannot ratify this. But the Senate ratified it by a margin of one vote. By 1838, the Cherokee still had not left of their own free will, and President Van Buren organized an army of 7,000 soldiers and militia who were then sent to evict about 16,000 remaining Cherokee. And once they were gone, the settlers could finally come in and stay. They didn't have to worry about conflict. They didn't have to worry about somebody else bringing a legal claim to their land. It was much easier. Not for the Cherokee, but for them. And it was in that old Cherokee hunting territory in Middle Tennessee, specifically Robertson County, outside of the town of Adams, that the Bell family would settle down. And it's possible that all of the trouble that began after that had to do with one Native American burial ground. Now, of course, the Bell family was getting there a little bit before all of this happened. They arrived in the 1810s. You see, in the decades following the War of 1812, there were a lot of Americans who pushed west into that still only nominally claimed territory, and one of them was the Bells. They, as well as a dozen or two other families, decided they were going to put down roots on the Red River right there in Tennessee. Today, this is just north of Nashville. The thing about this spot, however, is that local legend, as well as a couple of books and newspaper articles from the 1800s, suggests that the area is haunted. In fact, they suggest that the Bell family were subjected to a series of torments over the years 1817 to 1820. Now, the first thing you might want to ask is, what kind of people were these? Were they con men? Were they rude? Were they, were they unkind? It's complicated. According to the sources we have, John Bell Sr. was a very kind man. He was a good farm manager. He treated his employees well. It's just that not all of those employees employees were necessarily working th with him because they wanted to. So yes, John Bell is described as a kind and generous man who treats his employees well and works with his hands as much as his mind, but he was also a slave owner, and I just, I have to express that throughout this story, based because I'm using Richard Bell, his son, I'm using his account, it paints a very rosy picture of a slave owner, and I understand that that might be jarring, but it, I have to go by the source material that I have. That is why I am telling you right now that when you hear praise of John Bell, keep in mind he was a slave owner, that that was the norm for the time, and that's probably why you're not hearing a ton of criticism of him. There were, in fact, a few sections of the, the work that I decided to leave out because they were not directly important to the story and used some 
pretty rough language. Now, all of the description of John Bell is not that he was Santa Claus. He was written to be a hard-driving foreman, even with his own children, making sure that there were never idle hands and that when it was time to work, people were doing their jobs. Richard Bell also made it clear that his father never saw any trouble with the law and never got himself into debt. He always paid up front for everything. And of course, this would not be difficult because the Bells were actually making out really well down there in Tennessee. Mrs. Bell, whose name was Lucy, on the other hand, she was more in charge of the children's education and their moral upbringing. When she wasn't running the household, she was making sure that the kids were getting good moral instruction from a Christian source. And that good Christian upbringing is important here. It plays in. Because all of this is to kind of say that they weren't the type of family who would have made up that there was a demon or a witch haunting them. There must have been someone in the family, in fact, most of the members of the family, who believed that there was really something weird going on, even if there wasn't. And you'll understand why I say even if there wasn't as we get into it, because the degree to which this story is paranormal has often been questioned. It's not that there's nothing about it that seems paranormal. There certainly is. It's just that certain aspects make you wonder if this is not just a, a ghost story, but also a true crime story. And that story began in 1817, when Richard Bell, the author of the work that I used for this, Our Family Trouble, was a young boy, between six, uh, six and seven years old. Now this work, Our Family Trouble, was published a few decades after it was written, and it was believed that it was written in 1846, which of course was a few decades after all of the events transpired, and again, Richard Bell was between six and ten years old during the course of these events. According to him, everything was going really well for the family at this time. His one older brother was studying the law, another of his older brothers and one of his older sisters were off, had gotten married and settled down, and he and his siblings, who were still minors, were all just, you know, working on the farm, getting their educations. Everything sounds good about the Bell family. The exact quote from Bell is, everything seemed to be going smoothly when our trouble commenced. Now, everything, he would later learn, had not been going smoothly. His father and mother had been experiencing experiencing some odd things for a little while, and he only became aware of it a couple of years in. And these sounds weren't anything to become particularly concerned about. It was scratching on the exterior walls of the house, knocking sounds at the exterior doors, Certainly a little bit unsettling, but could easily just be somebody playing a prank, somebody harassing you, just trying to bother you. Wasn't necessarily anything paranormal. And then the sound started coming from inside the house. We traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. You hear me? It's coming from inside the house. It was 1818 when the full family began to suffer, and what at first sounded like scratching at the bedposts, like rats. You know, like... like one Sunday night in May of that same year, Richard, as well as his brothers John, Drew, and Joel, were awoken by that sound, and the two older boys, John and Drew, got up to kill the rat, only for the sound to stop when they did so. They examined the bedstand and found that, hmm, uh, there's, there's no, no scratch marks or bite marks here. That's weird. So they go get back in bed, rather confused, only for the sound to start up again. Bell claims that this process repeated about a half a dozen times until a little bit after midnight. Despite tearing their room apart over the course of the next few hours, they could not even locate a place where the rat could have entered the room. There was no crack in the wall, no hole, no floorboard that was, you know, creaky enough to get out. There was no way a rat could have gotten into their room and then gotten out that quickly. This continued every night for several weeks, and they eventually realized that whenever it stopped in their room, it would start in their sister Elizabeth's room down the hall. They soon realized that the whole family was affected, and that any time somebody got up to look for it, it would just go into a room where somebody was not up looking for it or still asleep. And then when that person got up, it would go to another room, and it would only stop once everybody in the house was out of bed. If they didn't all get out of bed, then it would continue until between 1 and 3 a.m. and then stop on its own. But the thing about this was, it wasn't just that this was kind of annoying, it was getting worse. The scratching sounds were getting heavier, as if they were more like a dog scratching on something than a rat. So they tore apart every single room in the house, looked through all of their possessions, even just sifting through clothing, making sure there were no animals in it, and there was no rat. On top of all of this, it wasn't just the rat scratching sounds anymore. There were also other new performances, as Richard Bell calls them, every night. The sounds themselves diversified, changing from scratching to choking, lip 
smacking, stones falling, chains dragging, all sorts of creepy, you know, horror movie noises. If this were something that were a story from 10 years ago, I would assume somebody had a really well-placed Bluetooth speaker, but considering this is 1818, I'm thinking that may be out of the question. At first, all of this was just auditory hallucinations, basically, but eventually it started to physically interact with the family. At first, slowly pulling people's blankets off of them as they slept, and then one night, it started to twist at Richard Bell's hair and then yanked. And then it did the same thing to his brother, and then his other brother, and then his other brother, and then his sister, and then his mom, and then his dad. The whole family. The entire family was spooked by this, and John Bell and his wife ended up staying up for the rest of the night to make sure that nothing was in the house with them. Now, this incident where it started to physically attack them seems to have been a turning point because it was here that they decided to, for the first time, open up to somebody outside of the family about this. They had been keeping it a secret because nobody wants to tell the community in 1818 that there's a demon in the house. That's not great for your reputation. So they went and told their friends the Johnsons or the Johnstons, depending on which account you read. James Bell Sr. invited Mr. Johnson and his wife over and they basically just wanted them to experience what they were experiencing. As well, James Johnson was a faith leader in the community, a well-read preacher, and they thought maybe if we have him bless the house and bless our family, it'll help us with whatever's going on here because they had some inkling that it was paranormal. Johnson led a prayer before dinner, directly addressed the issue at hand, and then they all retired to their respective rooms. In most horror movies, this would be the point at which the demon takes a night off and doesn't do anything to anybody so that everybody else in the community just assumes that this family is insane. This would of course isolate them from their friends and neighbors and make them more vulnerable. The demon already seems to be trying to keep them awake, whatever it is, but they're still not sure that this is an intelligent presence so much as just a, a malevolent energy. If anyone was expecting the demon to do the, uh, the typical Hollywood thing and take the night off, you are going to be sorely mistaken because it threw the kitchen sink at the Johnsons. It showed them every single thing that it had done to the Bells in the time that it had been there and they were startled, to say the least. And to Johnson, this implied that it was an intelligent force, that it had recognized why he was there, and that the reason it was doing this was to assert its power. So he asked it very directly, in the name of the Lord, what or who are you? What do you want? And why are you here? I would like to point out that James Johnson was a better ghost hunter than most people on YouTube. Although really with paranormal stuff, what you wanna do is ask yes or no questions or discreet things like, you know, stuff with numerical answers, which is what they ended up doing, but we'll get to that. Now this invocation of the Lord's name and the direct question, the interaction, seems to have quieted the entity, whatever it was, for a brief moment. And then it just returned with even more violence. And that violence was particularly directed at Elizabeth Bell, who also went by Betsy, or it seems that specifically whatever this thing was, it eventually took to calling her that. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. She began to feel as though she was being slapped by invisible hands, that her hair was being yanked. It was becoming very clear that this was more than the Bells could handle on their own. They needed help. After that evening's end, Johnson told Bell that he did believe this was an intelligent entity, that it was supernatural, paranormal, or preternatural in essence, in principle, in function, and that it was entirely beyond his comprehension. As such, he suggested that they tell the broader community because more minds might come to a conclusion more quickly. Bell obliged and quickly news was spread, committees were formed, experiments undertaken, faith leaders asked, and a close watch was kept on the family every night. Somebody was there making sure that nothing really, really bad happened to these people. Now, of course, how close that watch was is not entirely clear. It could have been that somebody was camped out outside the house. It could have been that somebody was going to check on them every morning and every night. It could have been that somebody was staying in the house with them. It's really not said which of those it is. Also, the family did have uh, slaves who lived in the home with them, but there aren't a ton of reliable first-hand accounts from those slaves so there's not much to be said for what they experienced. Despite all of this, the torment continued with the entire family continuing to experience the auditory hallucinations, those hair yanks, occasionally the feeling of being slapped, but it was really against Elizabeth that most of this was taken out. 
This would only happen to her when she was alone, however, so local girls began staying with her. But then they thought of something. Since Elizabeth was the primary victim, maybe if they took her out of the house, it would leave her alone. Or maybe it would follow her, and at the very least, they would know what was going on. So neighbors were asked to take her in, and most of them jumped at the opportunity. This was a very close-knit community. They were even spiritually all intermingled, despite the fact that most of them came from different Protestant traditions. I think there might have been a couple of Catholics involved as well. They all worshipped together. They would go usually house to house, holding service in one reverend or another's living room. And, you know, so it, religious integration was not an issue in this community because it was, for the most part, Protestant Christians from various denominations who were able to intermingle without much problem. So, of course, when one was in need, they were very quick to oblige. But as it turned out, it was not the house. It was not Elizabeth. It was not John Bell. It was the whole Bell family because Elizabeth continued to be tormented when she was alone, even outside of the Bell property, and the other weird stuff that was happening to the family continued along as usual. Now, this briefly did cause some to believe that Elizabeth was the cause of the problem, but after some debate, that was ruled to be illogical for a number of reasons, not least of which was that she was not in the Bell household and stuff was still happening. So, it all came back to Johnson's initial suggestion that maybe this is an intelligent entity, and they stopped trying to avoid it and began trying to communicate with it. They discovered that when spoken to, the entity would cease for a time and then return even more violent than before. And these developments led to an influx of visitors to the home who wanted to speak to the witch themselves and see what, what would come of it. They would ask it to tap on the wall, smack its lips, blow out a candle, you know, this and that, and eventually they devised a rudimentary manner of communicating, which was to ask it to, you know, tap on the wall a certain number of times Times if you asked how many of something there were, or to smack its lips, or to tap something for yes. Interestingly enough, if they asked it a question like, how many cows were in this farmer's barn this morning, it would know the answer and it would get it correct every single time, even when there was ostensibly no reason for it to know the answer. Another development came from outside the house where farmhands, family members, visitors would have rocks and sticks thrown at them or drop near them, but they could see nobody around who could have thrown it. Some also reported seeing candles floating through the woods. And at this point, it also began to just smack people across the face, especially when they would try and pull their covers back over them. Now, this was visitors to the home, Bell family members, Elizabeth Bell particularly was just really getting it. But it was more, according to Richard Bell, it was more than just the family that was experiencing this. And eventually, it began to communicate not just in lip smacks or taps on the wall, but in whispered tones. It would very softly speak to people even if you could only hear it when the room was otherwise completely silent. And as more and more people came to talk to it, it began to get stronger and stronger. It seemed that as more people paid attention to this entity, whatever it was, it grew more powerful. It was able to speak more loudly, more firmly. It was able to be more firm with people when it physically manipulated them. It was just getting stronger. And it wasn't long until whatever the entity was could speak loudly enough that everybody in the room could hear it talking. And while Richard Bell says he does not remember the first sentences it spoke, he does remember the first thing it said that was of note. It finally answered Johnson's initial question, and it said, I am a spirit. I was once very happy, but I have been disturbed. And this was allegedly in a feeble yet audible voice this first time. And they tried to get more information out of it, but it would say nothing further after that point. The next time it spoke anything worth recording, it was talking to John Bell Jr., and it was warning him against taking a trip to North Carolina. He was supposed to be going to check in on a property of his father's, and supposedly the estate sale had been wrapped up for a portion of it, and so he was, he was supposed to go there and get his portion of it and bring it back for his dad. Now, the spirit, the entity, whatever you want to call it, told John Bell Jr. that if he went, not only would he return empty-handed because nothing was actually complete yet, but also there would be a beautiful, wealthy young woman coming to visit, and that he had a chance to court her and possibly win her if he didn't go. John laughed this off, but according to the story, he went, he returned empty-handed, and in the time that he was gone, a beautiful young woman from Virginia who was very wealthy had come through and stayed for a little while, but she had left by the time he returned. Later on, the witch, 
as it was becoming known, gave them a little bit more information. But really quick, I just want to kind of clarify this, that witch in Appalachia in the 19th century was not, was not entirely the term we think of today when we think witch. A lot of people think Wicked Witch of the West, or maybe they think, uh, you know, more akin to like Wicca, that kind of thing. But a witch has not just in Appalachia, but all throughout the English speaking world, been a word that can mean a number of different things. It can be somebody who communes with the devil. It could be somebody who makes potions. There are a number of different things that this term could apply to. In this sense, it may have been the belief that, the, that a witch wasn't necessarily a person, but an entity created by a person or an entity haunting a person or perhaps someone gets involved with the dark arts and accidentally creates a version of their soul that floats around tormenting people. Anyway, I just want, I want it to be clear that when people say the Bell Witch, they're not referring to the belief that there was a specific old lady living off in the forest who was casting spells and curses on these people, but rather that there was an entity harming them is what having a witch meant to them. When I read the story, to me, what it sounds like is what the way we classically think of today of demons. But as for that more information it gave them, it went beyond just, I was once very happy, but now I've been disturbed. And it told them that it was the spirit of a person who had died and been buried on the property and that their grave was disturbed. The specific quote that it is alleged to have given them was, the spirit of a person who was buried in the woods nearby, and the grave has been disturbed, my bones disinterred and scattered, and one of my teeth was lost under this house, and I came here looking for that tooth. So it was looking for the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. This tale called to mind an incident from several years earlier when some of the farmhands, and the term farmhand is used, but I often have trouble discerning whether they're talking about the farmhands who were paid or the farmhands who were not, um, but some farmhands came across a patch of land that contained bones. James Bell was called out to take a look at it. He went, this is probably a native burial ground. We shouldn't disturb it. Whether that was out of superstition or respect is unclear. Richard attributes it to respect, but he says, let's not deal with this. Let's work around it. And I'll, I'll arrange to have it actually handled later properly. However, Drew Bell heard about it and he told one of his friends. That friend was Corbin Hall, who was another young man like Drew in their teens, and Corbin thought it would be fun to go and look for relics or treasures in the native burial ground, which I guess in the early 1800s, they didn't have nearly the same superstitions as us because digging around in a Native American burial ground is like no-no number one for almost any horror movie rule. Anyway, Corbin took a jawbone from one of the skeletons, brought it back to the house and was playing with it, threw it at a wall, the tooth fell out of the jawbone, through a crack, into the floor. Their father, uh, James Bell Sr., heard about the what was going on. He comes out, he reprimands them, and then he has one of the slaves take the, the jawbone back to the burial ground. Once this was all said, and it was revealed that, oh my god, we can get rid of this torment if we just find the tooth, James Bell tore up some of the floorboards in that spot where this event had occurred and started looking around for the tooth, but they could not find a tooth anywhere. It was at this point that the spirit, the witch, whatever you want to call it, informed old Jack Bell, John Bell Sr., that it was all just a joke, a prank that it had played on him. It just wanted to make a fool of him. Now, what you need to take note of there is that whatever this thing was, if we're dealing with a legitimate paranormal entity, it lied. That's kind of an important thing in IDing things. Generally, in the lore regarding ghosts, for example, they're not supposed to be able to lie to you. They're supposed to have to, at least in some form, tell you the truth about who they are, what happened, because ghosts are not supposed to be, and I know that this might sound like me being really arbitrary, just in, in doing what I do, it has come to be my opinion that ghosts can't lie that they're not, they, they don't have agency, that they're not functioning at a higher level where they could think to do that. They are simply the shadow, the impression of a person's soul that was left on the physical world. So it can't lie to you because it's not functioning up here. It's just reliving something. It is trapped, it is stuck. It might be angry and scared and confused, but it's, it's not gonna be able to lie. Whereas 
A demonic entity, or a person, could very well have lied. But by this point, the story was sufficiently famous and theories were starting to crop up. A lot of people had been to the Bell property, a lot of people had interacted with the Bell witch, and they had opinions. Some believed the story that it was the ghost of a Native American whose burial had been disturbed, the story that it had told, assuming that maybe the story about its identity was true, but just the tooth thing was, you know, was the joke. Others believed that maybe it was more like a demon or a witch, and then there were others still who believed that the entire thing had been made up for fame and fortune, that the Bells just came up with this whole story so that they could bring people down and make money off of it. According to Richard Bell, however, his family never charged any of these people for room, board, they, they would feed their horses, they would make sure nobody ever left hungry. Again, Richard Bell was very young when all of this happened and he might not have the full picture of what was going on, but from the accounts that exist, it seems that the Bells were not charging people to be there. In fact, he claims that his father went so far as to reject payment from visitors. But all of those theories would have to wait because for a while, the spirit really didn't say anything more about its identity until eventually it claimed that Actually, the Native American story, a little bit of a fib. The real story is that I was an early emigrant coming out here and I buried a treasure behind a rock and I want Elizabeth to have it. But then it refused to elaborate on the location of the treasure until Drew Bell and Bennett Porter specifically agreed to go and dig it up and also until James Johnson agreed that he would go and observe and count the money to make sure nobody lied. What's particularly interesting about this is that it referred to James Johnson not as James or Mr. Johnson, but as Old Sugarmouth. I don't like that either, Aiden. I saw your face and I don't like it either. They obliged and they were told to search under a flat rock at the mouth of the spring on the southwest corner of the farm and it had to be done that day or that next morning before word got out. Now the rock was right where it was said to be, down to the minute detail. The thing was, it was firmly lodged into the ground to the point where they were like, really? This rock? In the end, they spent about half a day removing the rock and digging a six foot deep, six foot wide hole to try and look for whatever money or treasure was supposed to be in there, only to discover that mm, there's nothing here. Then when they returned, the spirit just taunted them for being so gullible and proceeded to recount all of the silly things they had done that day to the rest of the family. But interestingly enough, the family seems to have found this to be a, a funny prank, you know, a good old joke played on those three people. Probable that Drew, Bennett, and James didn't find it particularly funny, but everybody else apparently laughed at it and repeated the story to more people as they visited. Perhaps the most interesting account, however, is of the spirit and how it interacted with local clergy and faith leaders. As I said, there was not one singular religious tradition in the town, Basically, everybody was a Protestant Christian, but there were Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians. You know, you didn't have one main church. They would all just share services and share worship together. Broader Christian community might take something from that. And in interactions with these faith leaders, these reverends from around the town, it could definitely quote scripture. It could tell you precisely what the verbiage of a Bible verse was at random. And it could even correct you if you misquoted scripture. Also, it could just recite sermons that had been given when it was not present. So whatever it was, it was able to be all over town. And one of the ways they would test this was they would just take a Bible, open it up to a random page, select a random verse, and ask the thing to recite what it was. Which meant that if this was just a person, that this was all a prank, or a hoax to accumulate money and, and fame, that person would have to have the entire Bible memorized, which there are people who have done that, but that's an impressive feat for somebody to pull off for what they don't seem to have been charging money for. And the sermons weren't the only evidence that its powers extended well beyond the Bell family, because as visitors would come, it could tell them very specific events from their lives. And these were complete strangers, as is said. People from Pennsylvania, from Florida, from Georgia, people who were not from Adams, Tennessee. One such instance involved a man named John, who actually was a community member, who expressed to the witch that he did not believe that stealing food, if you were starving, was a sin. And the witch replied, asking him if he ate that sheepskin, which shut him up immediately, and he walked off and never interacted with the witch again, and the reason for that is that several years prior, he had been accused of stealing a sheepskin. And it seems that the witch was sort of 
causing a little bit of mischief all over town with remarks like this because it knew everybody's dirty laundry somehow. So it would bring up old arguments and just cause a little bit of strife around town. So whatever or whoever was doing this, it had done two main things to this point. It had really tried to keep the Bells from sleeping, and it had also tried to cause a little bit of division around town, just petty differences, minor squabbles, but it was seemingly deliberately messing with people. If not necessarily evil, it was definitely mischievous. And then eventually, because the thing apparently knew everything, people began going and asking it what was going on at another house in that exact moment, at first out of curiosity, and then to Snoop. Allegedly, the spirit, the demon, the witch, whatever, would go away for about five minutes and then return with a report, which whenever they went to verify it, apparently it was generally verifiable, was the term used. Suggests to me that it had a high success rate, but not a perfect one. And one thing to make clear is that over time, this entity was developing new tendencies, yes, but it never abandoned its old ones. It simply added new tricks to the catalog. And as it went along, as it got more powerful, those older behaviors intensified, they got stronger. So if it was doing something beneficial for somebody, it would do something even more beneficial for somebody. But if it was doing something to harm somebody, it would become even more violent. It continued to yank sheets off of beds, pull pillows out from under people's heads, slap people, pull hair, make the weird scratching sounds, all of this in the Bell household, but it was particularly aggressive towards John Bell Sr. and Elizabeth Bell. And it was said that it would feign kindness towards Elizabeth, but then it was also afflicting her with these fainting spells. And these fainting spells were thought to be because the spirit was particularly opposed to Elizabeth Bell's courtship with a local man. At least in this version, as reported by Richard Bell, she, the, the spirit did not like this match, did not want them to get married, and was trying to stop it from happening. After Elizabeth Bell would faint, the spirit would simply wait for her to wake up again, say, are you fairly done now? And then continue along. It wouldn't actually say, are you done now? It wouldn't be that sassy. It might have been that sassy, but I don't have evidence it was. I'd like to think the Bell Witch was a little bit sassy. Anyway, it would wait until she was recovered from her fainting spell and then go on with the torment. Meanwhile, John Bell Sr. began to complain of a strange sensation in his mouth, which apparently had been going on since the sound started, but he didn't really want to worry anybody and he wasn't sure they were connected, so he just didn't bring it up. He described it as a stiffness of the tongue, as well as a feeling like there was a stick placed across his the back of his mouth and that it was pinching the edges, the sides of his jaws, that it was... Right here, he would feel a pinch on the inside of his mouth. Now, this didn't happen frequently, nor did it last particularly long when it did occur, but it was still cause for concern. But it did eventually worsen, going from, you know, a couple of hours that this might be uncomfortable, to 10 to 15 hours at a time when John Bell Sr. couldn't talk. The witch also began to express a explicit desire to harm John Bell, and started to lay off of Elizabeth a little bit, focusing more and more attention on John. It was also around this time that John developed contortions of the face, a twitching and dancing of his flesh, which laid him up for a time. All the while, they sought to understand what exactly they were dealing with, but the entity kept lying to them. First, it was the Native American looking for a tooth, then it was the emigrant who had left behind treasure, and then it was a dead child buried in North Carolina, and then it was even Johnson's stepmother's witch, which again, you gotta understand that witch in 18th, 19th century Appalachian folklore doesn't quite mean what witch means today, so some sort of spirit that had haunted Johnson's stepmother, or Johnson's stepmother had created some sort of spirit, or possibly Johnson's stepmother had been a witch and her soul was now this, this witch entity. But the point is, it gave them a ton of different answers. But finally, it was Reverend James Gunn's turn to ask the question, and for whatever reason, the witch told him he had done so in a way that it could no longer avoid. Basically, either he, it's, it's unclear if this meant that he had asked the question with such conviction and such faith in Christ that it couldn't lie to him, which would be the typical like exorcist style answer here, or it would be that he asked the question in words that could not be manipulated. And if it's that one, it's interesting because if it's that the way he asked it meant that it could no longer avoid the question, it implies that whatever we're dealing with here 
can't lie, rather than that it can and did choose to lie, but instead, the questions that were asked allowed it to answer untruthfully without necessarily lying. Again, not really enough here to come to a conclusion. But regardless of what reason it gave to say this, and whether or not it was even telling the truth, it said it was the witch of old Kate Batts. And that more importantly, it was determined to kill John Bell. Now, Kate Batts was a well-known and well-liked member of the community. Richard Bell wrote very fondly of her, saying that she was a kind and gentle woman who was always good to her neighbors and friends, but she was a little bit eccentric, a little odd, and her husband had been injured working on the farm and was disabled and she had taken over the property. And just, you know, there, there were some rumors about her, but for the most part, she was just a nice lady who was a little off. So James Gunn pretty immediately assumed this is just another lie, and this was trying to make me think that because I am a holy man, or because I asked the question in a certain way, basically he was looking at the analysis we just gave of whether or not she lied, and if she lied, what it implies, in the same way. Probably because he might have been thinking demon himself. In any case, he knew that the likelihood that this was Kate Batts was really low, but now that there was a name, he might have a bigger problem on his hands. It didn't matter if it was Kate Batts. Everybody thought it was. Nonetheless, they began to call the witch Kate, and it seemed to like that. Now, you know, what are you not supposed to do with paranormal entities? Name them, but it's fine. After this revelation, however, the personality of the entity changed, and it split into four different characters. Those characters were Mathematics, Psychography, Black Dog, and Jerusalem. They all had different voices, and they purported to be a family of witches led by Black Dog. Now, this was not permanent, but the voices would constantly bicker and argue and sing and do circus performances. I'm not quite sure what that meant, considering none of them were visible. But there was a lot of nonsense going on. It was stressful for the family. And when it finally ended and went back to Kate, they were almost grateful. It's at this point in the story that it's made abundantly clear that whatever this entity is, it is remarkably racist. It made a large number of comments about the enslaved population on the property, one of which was that it really did not like the way that they smelled. Uh, there is a series of phrases in the work that I absolutely cannot repeat, and that I'm concerned about even explaining what was said to you without YouTube telling me no, and me getting canceled. So I would recommend that you go read it yourself if you're curious about what exactly was said, but the gist is that it did not like the way the enslaved population smelled and would avoid their cabins for that reason. While it wouldn't bother the enslaved population while they were in their cabins, it would bother them while they were in the field, just as it would bother everybody else. One among that group, however, claimed that he could actually see it whenever he was alone, which is a little bit convenient but he, he described it as appearing to him as a black dog. Dean also would carry an axe as well as a witch ball, a, a, an anti-witch ward that had been made by his wife, and his wife apparently was owned by uh, the Porter family. And uh, again, I, I don't like that this history happened, but I do have to use the terminology. And one day, Dean appeared to work bruised and bloodied, only to tell everybody that it was in fact the witch that had gotten him. One of the other slaves, a boy by the name of Harry, also claimed that he had been beaten by the witch when he returned late with the firewood for the house. In this case, the witch allegedly told James Bell Sr., who she did not like, not to worry about the young boy because she'd see to his beating. It seemed that she hated the slaves more than she hated John Bell. Now, had they done anything? No! Not at all. But over time, a number of things were blamed on the witch nonetheless, including some of these beatings, as well as one of the girls who accidentally got her feet locked behind her head, trying to do that trick where you lock your ankles behind your head. Uh, she succeeded in getting them back there, but did not succeed in getting them unstuck. And uh, Mrs. Bell was not happy that she was slacking off, because once again, this was one of the uh, the non-voluntary help, and she uh, eventually was able to tell Mrs. Bell, no, 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 I wasn't screwing around. I, I, it's the witch that's holding my legs back here. So you can see that there are some circumstances where maybe the witch was being blamed for stuff that the witch wasn't doing. But again, there's that constant motif that the witch never bothers them in the slave cabins. 
And on one occasion, they actually attempted to see to what degree this was about the smell as the witch had suggested. So they had one of the slaves, a woman named Anki, sleep in the house, and they brought her into their bedroom and had her sleep on a pallet under their bed, and when they brought people in that night to interact with the witch, the witch cried out that there there was um, one of, one of I'm not going to use the terminology, but one of, uh, okay, um, the witch cried out that there was uh, a, a slave under the bed, and she wanted the slave out of there. I will let you imagine the terminology that was used, because it wasn't that. Enki then rolled out from under the bed with white liquid all over her face, screaming that the witch was going to spit her to death. And more transpired, according to Richard Bell, and especially according to uh, Martin Ingram, who wrote the, the wider book on this, but we can't cover all of that in this video because there simply was not enough time. So I want to skip ahead a little bit over some of the less important stuff to the fate of John Bell Sr. After a long passage about the virtues of his father and how unfair this was that a man who lived so upright a life should meet so sorry an end, he does tell us how he came to that end. The jerking and twitching and dancing of John Bell Sr.'s face had continued to worsen, and at this point it was lasting for one to two days at a time, but then when it went away, it went away for a while. And he'd be completely back to normal. There was no lasting injury from any of this. Or at least no lasting injury that was taking effect immediately. He seemed the same every time he came out of one of these spells. But as time wore on, they became more frequent and they lasted longer. All the while, the insults and threats directed at John by the witch continued. But in contrast, the spirit was always very kind to Lucy Bell, treated her very well. It was tender with her, it was warm, told her everything was going to be okay, and it didn't want to hurt her. It was affectionate with Lucy. And then, in October of 1820, there was a particularly severe attack, and John Bell, after that, did not leave the house very much. It lasted an entire week, and it really, he did not come back the same from that one. Sometime after that, while walking to one of the buildings on the property with his son, he suffered a full body seizure. Now it was said that his socks were being yanked off and thrown and his shoes by the witch and all of that, and then he had the seizure. According to Richard, this is when his father began to fear that death was on its way, that he was not going to be with them much longer, and you know what, at least at least the torment was going to end because he could not take it any longer. After they returned him to the house that day, he never left the house again. He was able to get up and down stairs for a while, but it, it was not long until he was bedridden. His family had arranged for him to see a doctor, the doctor had prescribed some medicines, it's 1820, so who knows what medicine meant, but they were giving this to him every day, and then on December 19th, 1820, John Bell Sr. did not awake at his usual time. Now, earlier in the morning, his wife, leaning over and seeing that he was still asleep, had gotten up to go and oversee the making of breakfast, but when he still wasn't up several hours later, his sons became concerned. They went to check on him and found him unresponsive, at which point John Jr. tried to go to the medicine cabinet to get whatever they had been giving his father. But instead of his father's medicine, John Jr. opened the cupboard to find a smoky-looking vial about one-third full of a dark liquid. And when he asked around, everyone denied knowledge of of where the medicine had gone and where this liquid had come from. They sent for a Dr. George Hobson, who lived in Port Royal, about three or four miles southwest, and as he made his way there, Kate claimed that it had been her who switched the vials. She told him that she had given John a big dose as he slept, and there was no use trying to save him now. Wondering what could have been in that vial, they took a piece of straw, dipped it into the vial, and then brushed it across a cat that they had found's tongue. The cat promptly ran around in a circle, convulsed, and then dropped dead. Coincidentally, the doctor smelled the vial, and then smelled John's breath, and came to the conclusion that whatever was in the vial had probably gone down his throat. They then decided, and this pains me as a historian, to chuck the vial into a fire to see what would happen to it. Produced a blue flame. As it turned out, however, the witch was right. There was no saving John Bell Sr., and he passed away the next day on December 20th, 1820. Interestingly enough, the witch ceased gloating during this time. It waited until after John was buried before it started bothering anybody again. And after that, it did go back to its usual nonsense and tormenting Elizabeth, but it weakened. And finally, it departed, according to Richard Bell, when Elizabeth decided to break off her courtship with Joshua Gardner. 
All the while, it had been allegedly urging her to not marry this young man. All of the abuse had been so that she would not do that, supposedly. Now, why it was abusing the entire family, can't really say, but for whatever reason, it really wanted John Bell Sr. to die, and it wanted Elizabeth to not marry this man. But once she did finally let go of this romantic attachment, the witch said a affectionate farewell to Lucy Bell, according to her son Richard, and then it told her that it would return in seven years to visit them and every other house in the town, and then it would be gone. It kept that promise and returned in February of 1828 with all of the whistles, however, the bells had scattered a bit, because most of the family had moved out. Only Richard and Joel, who were teenagers at the time, remained in the home with their mother. This time, however, they all agreed that they simply would not interact with the entity, and it only stayed around for about two weeks before it got bored and left. They don't know if it ever visited everybody else. And with that, the story of the Bell Witch, at least as far as the family themselves were concerned, comes to an end. And it's not a story that really makes sense. So what happened? Over the years, multiple versions of this story have emerged, but part of the problem is that there are no contemporary sources that discuss anything that happened. Or at least if they are, they've never come to light, with the exception of one, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. According to Richard Bell, the reason nobody kept a diary of events, the reason that nobody actually recorded any of this happening, is because they just were so caught up in everything that was going on that they didn't think to write a diary. He was also 10 when his father died, so he probably did not have the full picture of how people were handling this. And though it is possible that others documented all of these specific details that happened on the Bell property, nobody else wrote about any of it until 1856. In that year, it is said that the story appeared in a newspaper, but the only reference to that that I could find actually comes from somebody else who wrote about it, and was saying that it had appeared in the newspaper, and this is the story that was in the newspaper, but then they retracted it. So the lack of contemporary sources is troubling, but it's not complete. There is one contemporary record of this event. In 1820, an army officer, coincidentally named John Bell, was returning from an expedition out west and crossed Red River at Port Royal. While staying with a Murphy in Port Royal, he was told about a local story, something, a phenomenon that was going on just outside of town, about three miles from their property. Allegedly, there was a young woman around 15 years old who was accompanied by a voice, and that voice was telling her to marry a local boy. Thousands of people had come to speak to and hear this voice and ask it questions. As far as they were told, it would answer any question given to it. However, Captain John Bell, as we'll be referring to him, wrote that they often left as little satisfied in their curiosities as before they heard it. Many are under the impression that it is ventriloquism. Now, Richard's account does have a couple of differences here. One is that he insists on multiple occasions that the voice was feminine. In fact, it was generally feminine, but would sometimes have a more masculine tone to it, especially when it, it switched into those four. It also called itself Kate. It said that it was a female witch, essentially, or the witch of a woman, but it accepted a female name, and it spoke in a feminine voice. Aside from that, the other difference was that in Richard's account, the, the witch was trying to stop Elizabeth from marrying somebody, whereas in, in Captain John Bell's account, the witch is encouraging her to marry somebody. So either one of those could be the, the correct account. One of them must be wrong, though. On the one hand, Richard was actually one of the people who was alleged to have experienced all of this. On the other hand, Captain John Bell wrote about it 26 years earlier than he did. And as for why Richard Bell's account wasn't published for such a long time, it was because allegedly he had asked his son, a state representative in Tennessee, Alan Bell, not to share the story until all the people who were involved, all of the immediate family members of John Bell, had died. Now, you might think, well, that's convenient, because then all of the people who could have corroborated or denied are dead. On the other hand, you can kind of understand how, when you look at, for example, what happened with the Donner Party, around the same time that this document was supposed to have been written, they had to live with that for the rest of their lives. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, go watch our video on the Donner Party. It's good. But my point is that you can understand why, given the notoriety of this event, he might not have wanted any of his siblings to have to live through all of this being dredged up again. So what we can establish about the story is that, at the very least, 
it has its roots in Robertson County, Tennessee before 1820, or at least before October 1820, when we get that first mention of it from Captain John Bell. But there are still questions that need to be answered about the case if we assume Richard Bell was being honest. And I'm not saying that means that Richard Bell was right about everything that happened, that he presented an accurate account, but rather that he was not intentionally lying. That the way he recounted the story was as he remembered it, rather than some effort to make money off of it. Now, Richard Bell, of course, never published the story in his lifetime, and the way he writes it makes it seem more like he's trying to protect his father's reputation and tell, you know, his family's side of the story than it is trying to profit off of it. Now, if Richard isn't the one who wrote it, if perhaps it was Alan Bell who wrote it, then we can talk about maybe a profit motive. But if we're going to go with the impression that Richard Bell is the one who wrote this and he was honest about what he experienced and honest about why he didn't write about it for so long, we have to look at some things. Some of the things in here have perfectly reasonable natural explanations that you need to look at before you consider the paranormal. Elizabeth's fainting spells, for example, which were said to come on every night, essentially, or at least when they did come on, they came on at the same time every night, and that this was right before the appearance of the witch. These were described as her feeling a tightness in her chest, and then hyperventilating, and then passing out for 30 to 45 minutes. Now, if you or a loved one lives with anxiety disorder or panic disorder, you may recognize all of those symptoms as symptoms of a panic attack. Now, the 30 to 45 minute unconscious spell afterwards is certainly unusual for a panic attack, and again, Richard was 10 years old and may have simply misremembered, but tightness of the chest, then hyperventilation, and then passing out absolutely could be a panic attack. And if she was experiencing these slapping on the face, these creepy messages, this taunting from the, be the demon, this scratching, this knocking, all of these things, if all of these were happening every night, it's reasonable that she might get anxious right when it's about to happen every night and have a panic attack. And then there's the beatings that were attributed to the witch, which could easily have been fights or beatings in which the victim, the loser, the person who was being asked why they were all beaten up, did not want the other member in the fight or the perpetrator of the beating to know that it had been done. One example could be that Dean may have gotten into a fight with another slave and didn't want the foreman to know that he had gotten into a fight because that could be punished pretty severely back then. Or in the case of Harry, who it's claimed was beaten by the witch, it may be that he was beaten by Mr. Bell and didn't want to rat on Mr. Bell to anybody else in the family who might get upset with him because that could get him yet another beating. And while we do have this message that Mr. Bell was a very good man who was very good to his employees and all of that, we also have to remember that Richard was 10 years old and this was the old South, this was the slave owning South, and it's possible that he might not have actually even seen beating a slave as something that was bad simply because of the culture that he was raised in. So I'm not saying that John Bell Sr. absolutely did beat that boy, I'm just saying that it's possible that that's how he was beaten and why he kept it a secret, or why he blamed it on the witch. And then there's how John Bell Sr. died, which it could be that he was simply poisoned. This is one of the theories that's been brought up the most by people who don't believe this was paranormal at all, but rather a series of events that eventually led to John Bell Sr. being poisoned. Now, if John Bell had beaten that young boy, Harry, then Harry would have motivation to kill his, his master, and if he was gonna do it, he might as well blame it on the witch. But when you look at what happened here and the fact that the witch then supposedly gloated about having killed John Bell, Harry must have had partners and Harry must have had access to poison, so it doesn't seem like he could have acted alone here. He just didn't have the motivation or the means. But what strikes me most is the actual death itself, how it happened. Whatever poison was in that bottle, John Bell's breath smelled of it, and they had put that same poison onto a cat's tongue, and it had violently convulsed and rapidly died. The cat's symptoms match John Bell's symptoms. It would be a lot harder to tell if a cat's face was convulsing than a man's, but those convulsions, the twitching, we can't say for certain if the cat felt a stiffness in the tongue, but at the very least, the convulsions match. On the other hand, John deteriorated over time while the cat died instantly. But that could be attributable to John's early symptoms being the result of low dosage poisoning. Maybe it was just that a droplet of this was being dropped into his, his gruel in the morning, and so it took a long time to take effect. 
maybe it would build up in his system and then he would have an attack and then it would get better and then it would build up again. And then over time, as the symptoms got worse, maybe it was that whoever was doing the poisoning started upping the dosage or that the toxins were just building up in his body and he was deteriorating more and more as his body broke down from the poison. And then if the Bell Witch actually did kill him, whatever the Bell Witch that night was, then it seems like it probably gave him a large dose, in which case he would have convulsed. And if he was violently twitching in bed and likely making sounds as well, his wife probably should have woken up. After all, his wife was woken up by scratching on the exterior of the house and scratching at the bedposts. So she doesn't seem to have been a very heavy sleeper, which would make you think that if her husband was making noise and thrashing her out next to her, she probably would have noticed. She probably would have woken up, realized something was wrong. So I do wonder if Lucy Bell, who the ghost, the spirit was kind to, who was the last person to see John Bell alive, who is involved in basically every story where the Bell Witch does something that was planned, I have to wonder if she had something to do with it. Now, I don't know what the motivation would have been, but maybe it was as simple as John Bell had arranged for their daughter to marry somebody she didn't like. Or maybe John Bell didn't want her to marry somebody that she did want their daughter to marry, because it's, it's murky on which direction the, the witch felt about the boyfriend. But the point is, there were possibilities. There were reasons that Lucy Bell might have gone to this level. Also, there's the fact that some of it isn't accounted for, and that in and of itself could be another explanation for Lucy Bell's behavior if she did do this. Because while poisoning explains how John Bell died, and, you know, lying explains some of the beatings, and th there's, there's a number of things in this story that we went over, and some things that we didn't even cover here at the end portion, that, yeah, could be explained by natural phenomena or human activity. But th there's still the auditory stuff. Obviously, the scratching and knocking on the exterior of the house can be explained as somebody scratching and knocking on the exterior of the house. And in the same vein, the scratching at the bedposts and the knocking on the walls could be coming from under the floorboards and inside of the walls. I have a hard time accepting that, however, because it, it requires so many people being involved. And especially when we get to the conversations about scripture, there would have had to be somebody in town who was never present when the Bell Witch was, who was inside of the wall or under the floor or in a mattress. The, and, and keep in mind, this voice could come from anywhere in the house, allegedly. So there had to be somebody who, either there had to be one man who was both very well versed in scripture and also a talented ventriloquist, or there had to be two, one of whom was a ventriloquist and one of whom was very well versed in scripture. No matter how you cut it, every single time something happens here, you end up adding more people into this conspiracy and you have to wonder, could all of them really keep the secret? Basically, it's more likely that none of this ever happened than that Lucy Bell did it alone. And I honestly find it more likely personally, and you may look at me and go, Aiden, you're insane, and that's fine. I, th I think it's more likely that something actually was creating those scratching and knocking sounds and that somebody took advantage of the haunting to get rid of somebody. So I guess what I'm saying is Lucy Bell acting alone, I can make sense of. But the conversations and the events that took place would have required far too many people for her to be working alone and therefore I, I don't find her working alone to be likely. Now, of course, it could be that the way that Richard Bell presented these events significantly embellished what actually happened. It could be that it was nowhere near the level of you could pick a random p passage of scripture out of the Bible and it could recite it for you. It could have been that these were more party tricks that over time evolved. But like I said, that's then the conclusion that this never happened rather than that Lucy Bell did it alone. So what we have here bears the markings of, in my opinion, one of the greatest American ghost stories. There are things about this story that can't be natural, and there are things about this story that are almost certainly natural. So if it was a haunting, if there actually was something paranormal going on here, it's my opinion that yes, maybe the auditory stuff was a haunting. But the killing of John Bell Sr., I think a person did that. So I think that whoever did it either took advantage of the situation to get rid of somebody they didn't like, or that perhaps it was a demonic presence and it influenced somebody to kill John Bell. But what's fascinating about this story is that whether or not you believe that it's paranormal in nature, someone or something 
killed John Bell Sr. And nobody knows why. So obviously we hit you with a lot of information here and we, we didn't give you all of what exists on the Bell Witch. I basically tried to distill this down to what could be considered primary source information and maybe we'll revisit again sometime in the future and go down to the property and all of that. But for now, I'm curious what you guys think. You know, maybe I missed something. Maybe there's an aspect of the story that, that you guys had evidence of that I didn't find. So if there is anything where you're like, wait, no, I... I read an account. I, there was somebody's diary. Or in my family, you know, we come from Robertson County, we have this tradition, da, da. you know, tell me. Let me know in the comments, you know, get down there, discuss, converse, argue, maybe politely, but don't don't get too mean with each other. Um, you know, unless somebody's French. Uh, <laughs> kidding, I love you guys. And if you would like to support what we're doing here at the Lord Lodge, you can support us by subscribing to our Patreon for just $1 a month. That gets you access to some exclusive content. There will be more coming. I will be taking basically all of the notes from this year and uh, distilling them down into blog posts, which will be going onto the Patreon starting in 2024. So there's going to be that coming soon. There's also Drunk Folklore and Drunk History. We also have our Discord server, which you can access via bit.ly slash join the lodge. You can check out our merch at thelorelodge.shop or our coffee by Tableau Roasting Company at their website. All of this is linked in the description. We also do a podcast, and we do that Sunday nights at 7 p.m. unless there's an Eagles game, in which case it moves. We also have, like, a bunch of other channels now. There's the History Hut, the Weird Bible, the Lore Lounge, and my personal channel, Aiden Mattis. Content's coming. Eventually. <laughs> we were expecting the business to be in a different place right now. So once we can do fewer videos on this channel, we'll start putting videos on those channels. You'll get very long-form content, very well-researched content here, just three of them a month instead of four, and then you'll get one of those a month over on those two channels. Sorry. We're doing our best! We're trying so hard and getting so far. So, with all of that out of the way, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge. I'm Aiden Mattis. This was the wrong order. I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge. There we go!